Oh, now it's time. Yeah. So, uh, shall I? Or do you, can do you want to say something? Uh, no, you're good to go. Okay, so started. we are opening our session today. And the um, topic is morphosyntax and nominalization. We have three talks. And I'm very happy to introduce myself as Peter. You can call me Peter Costa. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm try to do it very short. And I know that if I introduce everyone, then we will lose time. So we start with the first talk. And you share, please, the um, screen with us presenting. So we have 20 minutes for presentation and another 10 minutes for discussion. So. It's, it's my talk, right? Yeah, the first one is, you know. Um, so. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for being at this talk. Um, you can download. You can download the slides to follow along um, if you wish on uh, the homepage of my website. I'm also sending it into the chat right now. And it's also on the um, title screen of the slideshow. Um, so I'll be talking about today uh, multiple feature inheritance and polysynthesis and specifically on what nominalizations can tell us about this uh, phenomenon. Um, so the main claim I'll be arguing for is that polypersonal polysynthetic agreement is licensed by long distance feature inheritance. And the language I'll be focusing on in particular is Wester Cash in a polysynthetic language. Um, and I'll be arguing that in this language agreement on lower verbal heads is licensed by a higher uh, verbal head um, in the left periphery, namely by C. And evidence for this approach comes from nominalizations with deficient functional structure. Very schematically, what do I mean by this? So nominalizations, um, the nominalizations I'll be talking about are these verbal extended projections, which are embedded under a nominalizer, right? So this little n here in this tree. Um, these uh, nominalizations include high functional structure up to T, so they include a full TP. Um, but they display deficient verbal agreement. So they don't look quite like a full TP, you, like what you would expect a full TP to look. So um, the lower verbal heads within this uh, structure actually behave as deficient biprobes. Um, and the way I'll be uh, analyzing this is that these verbal agree probes are deficient unless they're embedded under C. So unless you have a full CP, you're not going to see the full phi agreement properties of the probes. And this phi agreement, um, I will propose is licensed by C and it's best modeled as a type of multiple feature inheritance via agree because it has to be both long distance and it has to happen multiple times because there are several probes in the structure. So very schematically speaking, what is feature inheritance uh, kind of um, in previous literature? Well, um, the most broadly known is C to T feature inheritance, right? So the idea is that T comes in with an EPP probe. So in a sentence like the dog ate the cheese, T is uh, driving the movement of the subject to spec TP, but T doesn't have a phi probe by itself. It actually inherits it from C. Um, once it inherits this phi probe from C, it can then agree with the subject. Now, crucially, what does it mean if there is no C? Well, T then behaves as a defective EPP probe. In the absence of T, um, it has certain properties uh, that we saw earlier in the earlier example, but it doesn't display some other properties. So in particular, it still attracts the subject. So it still has an EPP feature, right? So in this sentence, the dog seems to eat cheese. Um, but it does not agree and it does not license the nominal or assign case, which in turn leads to this nominal moving to a higher position in the matrix clause. Um, so you end up having this dog not stay in spec TP in the lower clause, but move to the higher clause instead. Well, what happens in a system that has polypersonal agreement, right? So you have multiple uh, probes agreeing, agreeing with various arguments. Um, so I'll be arguing that in Wester Cashin, a, a language with polypersonalism, there are multiple phi probes, right? So in particular, T, little v, and apple. Um, and I will argue that these multiple heads have to inherit a phi probe from C. So it's not just T as in English that has to inherit a phi probe, it's also little v 
and Apple, right? So you have this happen happening multiple times and uh, at a longer distance. So it's not strictly local. Um, and uh, I'll be kind of proposing, uh, suggesting that this is best captured via an operation we already have, in particular, agree that it displays similar properties. Um, so here's some very basic information on West Circassian, the language I'll be uh, presenting on today. Um, it's also known as a digit, it belongs to the Northwest Caucasian family uh, and spoken primarily in the Republic of Adygea in Russia. It's agglutinating and polysynthetic, and I'll show you some examples in a second. And it has ergative case and ergative verbal agreement. Um, and data comes from my own fieldwork in Adygea. So here's the roadmap for the rest of the talk. I'll talk a bit about TP structure in West Circassian, so what you expect to see in a full TP. And then I'll move on to talk about the functional structure of nominalizations. Um, and uh, then I'll kind of wrap it all up with um, the core uh, proposal for how to account for uh, somewhat peculiar properties of these nominalizations. So first, let's talk about the TP structure. So West Circassian, as I've mentioned already, is polysynthetic. So it has prominent head marking and prodrop. So you might have a sentence like the following. You might have this single word, um, it's a single word, it's also a single, a full sentence. Um, so you don't need any overt noun phrases or pronouns. What you have instead is multiple exponents uh, referring to the various arguments, in this case, four different participants. So you have a separate marker for the absolute of theme, which is me in this case. You have a separate marker for the benefactive, um, which is for your sake in this case. You have a separate marker for the address C to them and a separate marker for the ergative agent he. Um, so, and there's a fixed order for the cross-reference markers, so it's somewhat templatic in nature. Um, so you have the absolutive come as the leftmost morpheme, absolutive meaning um, both the theme of a transitive verb and uh, the subject of an intransitive verb. And then you have uh, applied object agreement, which is accompanied usually by a specialized applicative morpheme, which uh, refers to the thematic role of that applied argument. And as you see in this example above, there could be multiples of those. So there's two in this particular example. And then this applicative uh, morphology is followed by the ergative agreement marker. So uh, as, as I've mentioned, the agreement morphology is organized in an ergative fashion where um, the absolute and the ergative uh, are uh, in a contrast with each other. So uh, an important property of the language that um, will be uh, kind of crucial to uh, how nominalizations work is that uh, the language is high absolute. Well, what does that mean? That means that the absolute of DP, regardless of its thematic role or where it was merged originally, moves to a higher position, um, uh, in, in particular, the specifier of TP. And evidence for this comes from parasitic gaps and reciprocal binding. And I'll talk about reciprocal binding here because it's most relevant to the nominalization data. And uh, here I'm just, uh, uh, including some references to previous work uh, that has proposed a high absolute of account for other languages and other types of phenomena. Uh, so what does this mean? Well, uh, schematically for a transitive ergative absolute of a sentence, this means that the absolute of theme is, uh, originates low, right, as a complement of V, but it moves to a higher position in spec, spec TP. And evidence for, the, for this comes from the behavior of reciprocals from anaphor binding. In particular, we know that reciprocals are generally bound by a C commanding antecedent. And if you look at the behavior of reciprocals in West Circassian, it turns out that actually the absolute of binds the ergative, which in turn means that the absolute of C commands the ergative. And here I have to kind of skim over a, a lot of the technical details of how I know that uh, the morphology you see is actually tracking the syntactic positions of the arguments. We can talk about that in the question period if you're interested, um, but very basically speaking, what you see, um, the way reciprocal uh, binding and generally anaphor binding in the language works is more, it's expressed morphologically primarily, right? We have this uh, polypersonal agreement. What happens is say you have a baseline transitive sentence such as we saw you, um, that we see there's an ergative uh, marker uh, and we see that there's an absolute marker. Well, if you have, uh, if you want to express reciprocal coindexation between these two arguments, the reciprocal actually shows up in the ergative position. Um, so if you wanna say something like we saw each other, if we were to translate this to English while preserving the thematic roles, you might actually end up with something like each other saw us. Um, so uh, 
what this means is that the absolutive actually is higher than the ergative. It binds the ergative um, from this high position. Um, I didn't talk about the applied argument, but there's also evidence from reciprocals that the absolute of binds uh, is higher than the applied argument as well and binds it as well, right? So you might see uh, an absolute of binding an ergative reciprocal, or you might see an absolute of binding an applied argument reciprocal. Right, so to summarize kind of the basic structure of the Western Cashin TP, uh, Western Cashin is high absolute of, the absolute of is the highest argument, and then lower down you see the ergative and the applied argument. Um, and very uh, kind of uh, briefly about how phi agreement works. Well, uh, since we have these dedicated positions for the agreement morphology, I propose that um, it is established between the head uh, that uh, essentially licenses that argument and its specifier, right? So T agrees with the absolute of DP, uh, little v agrees with the ergative DP, and Apple agrees with the applied argument. And also it includes uh, actually an exponent of the applicative morpheme itself, which is uh, marking the thematic role of the applied argument. Um, and there's some rearranging of these uh, morphemes, uh, I believe in the post syntax. Uh, so you end up with the surface order of the morphemes in the end. Right, so moving on uh, now, now that we have kind of a basic idea of what the TP structure looks like generally for the language, moving on to the functional structure of nominalizations. Uh, well, so first very basically about noun phrase structure. Uh, noun phrases also display some properties of polysynthesis in particular, they have phi agreement with a possessor, which is fairly uh, common for the language, the, the standard way of expressing possession. And they, another peculiar property of noun phrases is that complements and modifiers uh, generally end up incorporated. Um, so you, sorry, uh, oh, thank you. Um, so uh, as you see in this example, for example, Hebze in this example, um, that means something like their legal example, it appears between the possessive morpheme and the head noun. Um, and also displays some phonological properties of being incorporated. Now, uh, what do nominalizations look like, right? There are these mixed categories that have some verbal features, but also some nominal features. Well, if you take a finite uh, clause, something like I am washing dishes, uh, and you want to nominalize it, what you see is the following. Um, first of all, the arguments have to be expressed as possessors or they must be incorporated. So for example, if you take something like dishes, which is absolute of case marked in the finite case, um, you incorporate it um, in the nominalized form. So it doesn't bear absolute of case anymore. Um, and also there is no verbal, so that means there's no verbal license in your case, right? As there is in, the, in a full clause. There's also no tense or mood marking. Um, so there, there's, you can see this present tense prefix morpheme in the finite version of this sentence and there's nothing comparable in the nominalization. And finally, there's no verbal phi agreement. Um, so you have um, some ergative and absolute phi agreement in the uh, finite uh, example and there's nothing comparable in the um, nominalization. Instead, you see possessor phi agreement. Um, and there is one exception to this rule that will be very crucial to um, the discussion here that I will talk about in just a second. Um, so there's, uh, what we've seen so far is that there's no verbal phi agreement generally, and there's no verbal case in licensing, which might at first suggest that the structure of these things is fairly small, right? There's not that much verbal structure included in these nominalizations. But there's actually evidence that these nominalizations include structure up to TP. And the evidence comes from, first of all, the presence of morphological reflexes of little v and apple. And uh, from anaphore agreement, we'll see that there, there can actually be some phi agreement in these constructions, but it's very, very limited. And also, uh, there's actually evidence that nominalizations still have a high absolute of structure, just as a full TP does, a, a finite TP does, excuse me. Uh, so first of all, uh, about morphological reflexes of little v and apple. Um, nominalizations can include causatives, as the ch in this um, example is the structure or causing to perish of traditions, uh, which you might think of as a type of little v or maybe even a head that's slightly higher than little v. Um, but it all, in the language, it always uh, introduces an external argument. So it's an external argument introducing type of head. Um, nominalizations may also include applicatives, right? So you see this committative morpheme de and their way of playing with puppies. Um, and in this case, you see that there's no phi agreement coming along with this committative morpheme. Uh, usually it, um, 
is right next to apply agreement morpheme referring to the applied argument, but you can see still this applicative kind of showing up by itself. Um, and also the other thing about um, the functional structure of the morphology is that nominalizations allow for anaphor agreement. So for example, you might have reciprocal agreement with an applicative. So here's a finite kind of baseline sentence, something like they work hard for each other. So you have a benefactive reciprocal. If you nominalize this form, you can actually have that reciprocal stay in the nominalization. So you wouldn't be able to have a regular finite uh, agreement morpheme in this case, a, a full five feature agreement morpheme, so they're like, you know, for us or for them, but you can have for each other in this case. Um, and you can also have reciprocal agreement with the ergative, not just with the applied argument. So you might have something like they are making each other dance. This is the finite baseline form. You have the reciprocal agreement morpheme. If you nominalize this, um, you then have their manner of making each other dance. And once again, you see this ergative morpheme uh, showing up, this ergative reciprocal agreement morpheme. And crucially, I've chosen this particular example, this kind of complicated um, causative form, because I wanted to choose a form that has the cislocative morpheme, which clearly shows the cislocative morpheme goes between the absolutive, um, which is the leftmost agreement marker, and the other types of agreement markers. So what this shows, the fact that this z or z shows up to the um, right of the cislocative morpheme is that this is really agreement with the ergative, not you know some kind of uh, marker that's moving around. It's really showing up exactly in the place where you expect to see agreement with the ergative argument. Uh, now, uh, so, so what this indicates, right, is that in anomalization, the absolute still binds the ergative despite uh, the lack of regular phi agreement or case assignment. So it's still high absolute in a sense, right? So uh, the, the caveat here is that the, the argument isn't, exactly, uh, isn't actually assigned absolute case, right? Um, but the absolute of theme still binds the ergative agent. So kind of uh, summarizing uh, uh, this part, non, uh, the ergative reciprocal is bound by a high absolute of, and then there's also some evidence for there being additional evidence for there being high functional structure that the, that the nominalization includes structure uh, as high STP from uh, the possibility of clausal and some types of temporal adjuncts, which are in the appendix. Um, and if you're really interested, we can talk about that in the question period. Um, so here's the question. If nominalizations contain a full TP, why is the verbal syntax so diminished? Um, there's, you can only have anaphor agreement, no regular phi agreement. Um, there's no verbal case or licensing, so you don't see regular absolute or ergative case. Um, and uh, what I propose is that uh, the reason for this is that phi probes must be licensed by C. Um, and uh, I think a good way of modeling this is by saying that there could be feature inheritance through agree. So here's kind of the core proposal uh, uh, of this talk. Um, so suppose you have, uh, first I wanna talk about how phi agreement is licensed by C in a full finite clause, right? So not an anomalization. Suppose we have this um, kind of finite uh, structure with three arguments, right? They will sew dresses for each other um, here is the kind of uh, general structure of the sentence, right? So you have a full TP, you have C uh, high up, right? So you have these three uh, five probes in the structure, T, little v, and apple. Um, each one uh, triggers either merge or move of uh, an argument. Um, for apple and little v, that's merge. For the absolute of the, the absolute of theme, for T, that's move. So the absolute of theme originates slow, but it moves to that higher position. Um, C in turn comes in with the phi probe um, and that phi probe is subsequently transferred to T, little v and apple, right? So there's multiple instances of feature inheritance down the, the tree essentially. Um, and then T and little v and apple are free to agree with their arguments. So you have this full type of agreement as you see in a finite clause. So what happens in a nominalization, right? In the absence of C. Uh, uh, so I've, I've, I have anomalized form of this, the exact same uh, verb as we saw in the previous example, right? So they're sewing of dresses for each other. In this case, crucially, I wanted to include an example with some anaphor agreement so we can see how that can be accounted for with the, within this kind of approach, right? So it has a reciprocal benefactive uh, agreement morpheme in this case. 
So again, in this case, we have a full TP, right? So up to TP, the structure is more or less the same. You have the same five probes, T, little v, and apple. They still trigger merge or move, right? So you still have the arguments in the same positions as in a full finite clause. Um, but the difference is that there is no C, right? Um, so there's no transfer of a full phi probe down to these uh, lower probes. Oh, what I um, uh, suggest is that um, the, these probes aren't exactly, they're not completely bare. There is some, some probe capacity. There's some agreement capacity on these um, heads, but it's not a full phi set. So, and here I'm gonna say that it's a um, number that they agree in, but I think Perhaps this could be modeled in different ways. Crucially, it has to be in, deficient in the correct way so that you correctly uh, track agreement with an anaphore, but not with a full nominal. So what happens with these deficient number phi probes? Well, uh, the arguments, every argument except for the applied argument, uh, um, which is a reciprocal, comes in with a full set of phi features. The reciprocal in turn, um, I want to say, is as has been uh, uh, proposed by uh, a lot of researchers is phi deficient in some way. And here I'll just say that it has only a number feature and no person feature. Um, the, the other types of arguments, since they have a full phi set, a uh, set, full set of phi features, um, they actually cannot be agreed with, with with this deficient probe. So agree fails between T and the absolute of DP and also between little v and the ergative dp. But since the applied argument has a, a def this deficient set of phi features, wh which matches exactly the deficient set of phi features on Apple, this agreement is actually possible. So this accounts for the fact that you do see some agreement um, in nominalizations, but only with um, anaphores and not with full nominals. All right, so kind of wrapping up really quickly. Um, what I've argued for is that you have multiple phi agreement probes licensed by C in a language with polypersonalism. And evidence for this comes from nominalizations where you have phi probes uh, present in the structure, but agreement is deficient. And this in turn suggests that there's an indirect connection between case agreement and the given verbal projection. So for example, little v assigns ergative case and agrees in the kind of an ergative agreement um, only in the presence of C, not by itself. So you can't really conclude anything about the um, size of a structure just by the absence uh, of a particular, say, agreement relation. Uh, for West Cash in particular, that means that nominalizations are larger than they might first appear to be. Um, so uh, I think I am out of time. So I'm not going to go into detail about the different connections. Um, I will uh, mention that there have been previous uh, uh, suggestions that multiple feature inheritance might be necessary, um, in particular in cartography, and that there's a kind of a growing set of um, kind of data where you really do need um, a kind of indirect licensing approach. So you have a head that is either agreeing or licensing, agreeing with or licensing something in the structure, but it can only do that if there's another higher head that licenses that relationship. And I uh, suggest that it might be the case that this type of feature inheritance approach um, is, is a way of um, thinking about these types of structures. And I think this also could tell us something about the phi, the particular nature of phi deficiency in anaphores, because it crucially has to be such that you can di differentiate between anaphores and other types of arguments to allow for this kind of deficient agreement and nominalizations. Um, and uh, finally, uh, there's been some uh, work uh, that's proposed that nominalizations include something like mixed extended projections. So, you know, like a nominal T, maybe nominal aspect. Um, and I think this could be an alternative account where instead of having uh, extended projections kind of specified by part of speech, uh, it just, their, their properties will depend on whether or not they're merged under a, a higher C head, essentially. Um, so thank you for your attention. And sorry, I think I might've uh, trailed you. Thank you. Then, uh, thank you so much for your one very, very interesting talk. And I open the discussion round we have until uh, our time. It's, uh, so uh, another 10, eight minutes, let's say, until the next talk. So please ask your questions. Is there any question left in the... Julie Legat, Legate, Legate please. Uh, you have a question here in the chat. The multiple inheritance approach is interesting. I'm wondering, could we not interpret these data as evidence that the reciprocal agreement is not agreement, but rather detransitization morphology? Then we can stick with inheritance and don't suddenly need you. Uh, 
uh, probes? Yes, thank you. That's a very good question. Um, the uh, I think there's a lot I, I couldn't really talk about because um, uh, it's, it can't really fit within the purview of this talk. Um, but the, uh, the short answer would be that it's really, really, it would be really difficult to analyze um, this anaphore morphology as a type of detransitivizer. So um, you can see this, the same type of anaphore agreement, not just for this type of ergative um, reciprocal binding, but also for applicative reciprocal binding. And in that case, you really don't detransitivize in any way. Um, so you don't change the case morphology or the case assigning properties of that predicate. Um, and then uh, there's all sorts of morphological properties this morphology displays that really doesn't um, mesh well with the detransitivizing approach. So it really looks like it's um, it's agreement with something. Um, so there and, are a lot of other questions. I will just repeat them. Tom Rapper. I'm, I'm seeing some questions. It, you can maybe on. directly uh, answer it. Yeah, you just look into the chat room. So Rapper, yeah. Baker. Weber. Okay, so the, the question by um, Tom Roper is in English, yeah. there's a manner ambiguity in nominalization. Uh, yeah, yeah. Two. Also here and so on. So it's just it one after the other as soon as we, of course, we still have time. Right, so the, his singing, singing of the song surprised us uh, could mean either the fact that he sang, sang or the manner of his singing. Um, yeah, actually, I think so. In, in West Circassian, I believe the, the nominalizations I'm talking about don't, they're not fact nominalizations. There's a different type of nominalization you can do. Um, so what these mean are, are really something like um, the manner that he sang, how he sang, um, uh, or just his uh, singing, kind of his inclination to sing. So it's not, it's not about um, a, a factual event. Um, so Mark Baker asks, let me see. Okay, so this is very similar to Julie Leggett's question. Um, could what you analyze as an ergative reciprocal morphine be analyzed instead as a reciprocal voice marker? Um, Detransitivization explains why the surviving agent is coded as an absolute. Right, so this um, again uh, goes back to the first uh, answer that um, this is actually, it would be very difficult to do so. Um, there are good reasons to believe that this morphine really is not behaving as a detransitivizer. It falls into a bigger pattern of just replacing agreement with a particular marker in that particular position where you expect agreement with that marker to show up. And it doesn't necessarily um, involve a case, uh, a kind of a rearrangement of case assigning properties um, of the predicate. Um, let me see. And Natalie Weber was about clarification question. Okay, so the clarification question. Uh, so I understood why nominalizations contain structure up to little vp. Uh, what was the argument of them containing tp? Uh, is there an alternative analysis where the possessor is introduced at the top of a vp and is able to bind the reflexive? From there. Well, that's an actually, so in, in regards to the alternative analysis, um, that's a good question. I haven't thought about that too much. Um, what I would be worried about is that you actually, that it's absolutely impossible to bind um, reflexes and nominals generally. So you never see a possessor binding a reflexive otherwise. Um, but that is an interesting alternative. I'll, th I'll think about that. Um, so the, the main argument for, for them containing a full TP, uh, the one I talked about in the talk was about reciprocal binding, um, that you really have to have the absolute of move to a position that's high enough to bind the ergative. It would, if it, for example, was to move to spec little VP, it would be too local to the ergative to be a, a viable antecedent. So it has to move to a higher position than that. Um, and then there's also uh, some data I didn't talk about um, where you see Clausal adjuncts that you generally think of being fairly high in the structure being possible uh, in these constructions as well. And there is another Perez, Doric Toquero Perez. Uh, and then we have Ivona Kuchero. I think that we also have to close it after these three following. Uh, there will be Perez, Kucherova, David Pesetsky from MIT, and uh, Rafael Abramovic. And then we have to close it because we have the next talk, yeah, if I may ask you. Or maybe you can, some of them you can answer also in separately in the chat room, but 
maybe you just put one. It's your decision. So I have to choose one. Yes, I know. No, you may you may choose two, but just go on. David Pesetsky is maybe very interesting. Also, Ivona Kucherova. All 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 are interesting, of course. So just I don't want to make the choice. I don't need to make the choice. Yeah. So I think that the two of the questions are kind of um, of the yeah. same purpose yeah. regarding phases. Um, yeah. What what this means for phases. Yeah. Um, so the, the question is, what is the phase status of little VP? Um, why would feature inheritance cross phase boundaries? Um, and uh, how does C know to discharge the right probes on each particular head? Um, yeah, so that's a very good question. I, um, I actually do not think that little VP is a phase. Um, in the language, or at least it's not a phase in the same manner that um, CP is. Um, but uh, I, I honestly don't have the time to kind of flesh it out right right now. And I probably also don't have a very good account for David this. David kindly said that his question was already answered. So you, I think we, maybe you can still answer the, the last one, Abramovitz, and we have to go to the next talk actually. If I may interrupt it on this place. I thank all the discussant and all of you, especially for the very nice talk. I loved it also. I won't ask any question. I will introduce the next talk. Thank you very much. And uh, the next talk is now uh, Emily Henning from University of Manchester, which is not so far from here, <laughs> from Berlin. And her talk is the, here about motivating possessive phrases in thematic subject nominalizations. Please go on and thank you once again, Xenia Hirschova for your wonderful talk. I didn't mention a lot about you that you come from Stanford and so on, because we don't have enough time for this, but all people can just follow the homepages of these people who are presenting. Thank you. Okay, so I guess I'll get started. Yes, thanks, please. <laughs> thanks for coming to my talk. So I'll start with the observation that since remarks on nominalization, there's been a lot of work on the verbal versus nominal components of different types of nominalizations. So in that work in particular, um, the focus was on complex event nominalizations as well as gerunds. However, subject nominalizations are a type that have received less attention. Um, there's one exception to this, which is ER nominals that you're probably familiar with from English, like you see in one, the writer of the book. Today I'm going to focus on subject nominalizations in Washoe, which look like what you see here in two and three. So in two, we have Danu Tishuha, person healer, and in three, Damtanga, hunter. So these are formed with the phonologically conditioned prefix ta and da, so that da variant occurs before a vowel, and the da plus vowel harmony occurs before a consonant. And as you can see, these refer roughly to the verb subject in a way that I'll make more precise as we go. Now, the interest in subject nominalizations and the work that um, is out there focuses on a few different areas. The first has to do with nominalization size, so how much verbal structure is projected. The second has to do with the nominalizer itself, so where it's encoded and what it's doing semantically. And then finally, there's been an interest in the interpretation of how we get the correct individual meaning for this nominalization type. So in today's talk, I'm going to offer a kind of broad overview of these three areas, and I'll make um, a few specific proposals. In terms of nominalization size, I'll uh, argue- there are, there are some questions about the slides. Uh, I just saw it in the chat room, uh, whether we can uh, click again and make it bigger or whatever. Bigger. The some are, yeah, they are a little bit, so people can see it full screen maybe. Um, they are- Your questions? <laughs> Some people were complaining about not having it big enough or whatever. If you have um, a Windows, try the FN button with F F11. That's a full screen. Sorry for the interaction. Now just react to the. I have a Mac. Um, give me one second. Okay, so people are saying that it's. I can see it well, but maybe there are from other places. It's maybe, yeah. Now it's much better. It's much better. Yeah, I think. Okay. Um, yes. Thank you. Go on. Sorry is this for, okay? Is it okay how it is now? Sorry for interrupting. I, you. I can see it good. I also. 
Okay, I didn't okay. change anything. Okay, others, it's okay now. Good. Thank you very much for this. Sorry for the interruption. No it's problem. Not, I'm glad it's okay now. British. <laughs> it was <Okay>. German. Sorry. <laughs> All right, yeah, so the claim about nom nominalization size is that the verbal projections project up to ASPI um, and they contain a projected subject. Uh, in terms of the nominalizer, I'm actually going to argue that the prefix that you saw that I just showed is actually not a nominalizer, but rather the reflex of possessor agreement with an unexpressed possessor. And in terms of interpretation, I'll argue that um, the correct meaning results from reduced relative formation plus nominalization by um, a POS head. So I'll start now with the background on the language that I'm talking about, which is Washoe. And here is a map of where it's spoken. Um, this is the Great Basin aerial region of the Western United States. And Washoe is spoken here around Lake Tahoe on the border of California and Nevada. In Washoe. Um, so Washoe is a highly endangered language and it's an isolate though it's been linked to the proposed Hoking group. It's um, SOV language with prodrop and an agglutinative um, bromorphology. Nice. And this project, this project is part of a larger documentation project that's spearheaded at the University of Chicago. I ask all people to switch off the uh, micros because there is some noise here around. You should let the speaker talk clearly. Okay, so then diving first into the um, nominalization size. Uh, so broadly speaking, when you look at the literature on subject nominalizations, people have talked about two main kinds. Um, the first is the external argument ER nominals that I mentioned in the introduction. And the second is essentially other. So this isn't really a type, but it's more of a mixed bag of things that look like subject nominalizations, but are may or may not be idiosyncratic across languages. Um, but there have been some core characteristics, for example, that differentiate them, and particularly this has come out from the work on the ER nominal type. Um, so for example, in this type of nominalization, it's been shown that no complement structure is allowed. So in four, we can have the defenders of human rights, as long as we have the um, of present, but an accusative object is not licensed directly. Uh, and secondly, it's been shown that this type of nominal is limited to external argument roles. So it's bad, for example, with unaccusatives, making ER nominals like a peer or dire, um, not well-formed nominalizations in English. So it's been proposed, for example, that we can account for these on the structural level if we treat ER nominals as relatively small. Um, so to give an example, Baker and Vinokuropa argue that the structure of an ER nominal is something like you see in six here, which is, is relatively small and a nominalization of a big BP. Um, and in their account, it's very important that the nominalizer is essentially a nominal correlate of voice. And what it does is it takes the place of an external argument and introduces the correct semantics of what an external argument otherwise would. Now, another part of this analysis is because we just have a big BP, we don't have a little v or voice head to assign accusative. And this is why this of insertion is necessary because accusative can't be assigned. Now, if we go back to Washoe, I'm just gonna mention a few different um, proposals that have been put out there for the types of constructions that we're looking at. Um, so first in um, William Jacobson's dissertation on the language, he wrote that this type of prefix is a transitive verb nominalizer, which looks like it might work fairly well. So just for the examples that we saw already in seven and eight, person, healer, um, and hunter. And in more recent work by Bachneck et al., um, they essentially adapt the Baker and Vinokurova analysis to Washoe and argue that the prefix is an external role nominalizer. So for a nominalization like in 9a, Danga de Doda, a house builder or one who builds houses, we have the structure that you see in 9b, where again, the nominalization is pretty small, just a big VP. Um, and again, the role of the nominalizer is to take the place of the external argument and introduce an external argument semantics. But as we'll show in the rest of this section, um, neither of those views is, uh, is quite right. So for a few reasons. Um, first, this nominalization type is not limited to transitive verbs or external roles. Uh, secondly, there's more structure going on and the subject position is in fact projected. Not take, in the, it's not the case that a nominalizer takes its place. And then finally, the prefix is not a nominalizer at all, but rather it's agreement. So beginning with the types of structural evidence that we have, um, we have a few different pieces of evidence for little VP. 
So these types of nominals allow for accusative direct objects, although I'll note that nominals in Washo are never case marked, so they appear bare. But for example, you don't see any kind of oblique case marking or types of post positions to introduce them. So we have the example in 10. This is a rather long nominalization. And this is literally, he is one who does not make a car fly to Reno. Now in this example, we have an, a direct object here, it's car. And just so you know, this ma suffix is negative concord licensed by negation. It's not any kind of case marker. Um, and in, in the same vein, we also find evidence for over little b morphology. So for example, the causative suffix ha is also possible. Now, additionally, we find a flexible subject type in Washo, which is unlike the um, ER type. And we see that interpretation here is not restricted to agents or even external arguments. So we see in 11a that a state holder position can, um, can be nominalized in del TTB, a thing that is stout. Um, and 11b shows, for example, that it also works with um, unaccusative patients as in Dagota, where unaccusativity is diagnosed by the encoative causative alternation in the language. So the availability of the flexibility in the subject type reveals that the nominalizer doesn't really replace the subject because we have uh, too many different possible meanings for that to be the case. And we in fact have additional evidence that we have a syntactically projected subject, which comes from reflexives. And this you can see here in 12. Um, so the normal way to say my name is in the language is to use this reflexive construction. Um, in this case, we have Ramona Dagumdie Lei, my name is Ramona, or more, lit more literally, I am one who calls herself Ramona. Right, so the fact that we have a reflexive here really points to the idea that we need a syntactically present antecedent in order to license this anaphor. Right, so, and I'll just note here actually just fairly briefly in passing, but just for completeness, that these nominalizations are also larger than little bp. Um, so we have additional evidence for ASP, which comes from restructuring. Uh, you can see this here in 13, Tisham um, Iwayis. This is one who doesn't stop singing. Um, and the idea here is to follow the idea that uh, functional restructuring verbs are ASP heads. So they're just, um, Iwe here is the aspectual predicate that simply takes the place of a functional head in the clausal spine. And so the presence of this type of affix inside of the nominalization indicates the presence of SP. So um, this leads us to the preliminary structure here in 14a for um, a nominalization like one who heals people. And this structure has two main characteristics. Uh, so first, it's fairly large. It contains SP. And secondly, we have a projected big pro subject. So the, what we see at the end of the day is that Washo patterns with this other category, and I don't have time to go into detail of a full comparison, but a very similar structures have been proposed, for example, for Gikuyu by Baker and Vinokurova and for Northern Paiute by Tosar Bandani. Okay, so now moving on to the quote unquote nominalizer because I haven't said anything about that yet and I've just been focusing on the verbal structure. Um, I'll argue in this section, as I've mentioned already, that this prefix is really just possessor agreement with the covert possessor. Um, so the presence of this prefix it, um, shows that POSP is the source of nominalization. And while it's not itself the realization of any kind of nominalizing head, it diagnoses the presence of POS in the structure. So why am I saying it's agreement? Um, well, Washer makes use of uh, what's called expressed versus unexpressed possessor agreement in the third person. And what this means is that if the possessor is overt, possessor agreement marks person as normal. And by as normal, I mean, it looks exactly the same as the verbal paradigm. And this you see in 15, Damotmo Angal, the woman's house. In this case, the possessor is overt and we get normal agreement marking. However, if the possessor is covert, we get a different prefix. And so you can see this in 16 with a similar example um, uh, with the intended meaning of her house. However, where the subject is not pronounced, and in this case, we get dangal instead of the normal um, glottal stop prefix. So as you might have already noticed, this is the same phonologically conditioned prefix that we see in subject nominalizations. And 17 and 18 just show them side by side with both the preconsonant and prevocalic variants. So in 17a, we have dagushu, his or her pet, and the subject nominalization parallel in 18a, damtanga, hunter. Similarly, before the vowel, dangal, his or her house, and then Danutishuha as a subject nominal and person healer. So this leads us now to the revised structure that you see in 19, where we have a, a new nominalization source on top of ASP, which um, I argued to be POS. All right, so where does this agreement come from and um, how do we explain it? 
Um, so we can understand possessor agreement in the general case by understanding POS as a nominal, nominal correlate of T. So just for a normal example of possessor agreement, like in 20A, Adele Angal, um, we can assume that the possessor is merged in the specifier of POS P, and that possessor agreement is the result of an agar probe above POS. So agar will probe downward to Adele, pick up the third person five features, and then spell that out as an agreement prefix. Now, why is agreement sensitive to the overtness of the possessor? Uh, what we have is essentially the generalization in 21, where agar is spelled out as this special prefix if and, if and only if the possessor is covert. Um, and this is especially striking because there's no distinction like this in the first and second person. So the 22 and 23 just show with first and second that the form of the agreement doesn't um, depend on whether or not the possessor is overt or not, it stays invariant regardless. Now, without going into a detailed analysis, I'm just going to give a nutshell of a proposal and an idea here, um, which is that in the case of pro drop, um, in general case, so say for first and second person, we have two agreements. So what we have is licensing of agreements, even in the absence of an overt subject. On the other hand, third person, um, the third person uh, da, um, prefix can be treated as a subject clinic that it undergoes incorporation um, it, essentially into the, um, the, the possessive structure. So this has been proposed, for example, by Brennan for Irish. Um, this is not necessarily a canonical analysis and I'm, and I'm also not necessarily endorsing it because Irish is quite different from Washoe. Um, but this has been proposed, for example, to explain complementarity between overtness of a pronoun and possessor agreement in, in other languages. Okay, so now if we adopt that idea, then how does this work for subject nominalizations? So if we take our structure again, where we have a nominalization ASP, sorry, a structure of ASP nominalized inside of POS, then we'll have a, um, a structure that looks like what you see in 24. And so here, agar will probe and find big pro. And then I'm going to assume that big pro begins life as a minimal pronoun. So it's, it's pretty unspecified. It doesn't have a ton of features, but since we're dealing with a, a kind of pro arb subject here, it's gonna have a third person feature. And just like little pro, that little person feature is, is going to enable enable it to undergo incorporation or clinicization, just like in the case of the third person little pro. So what we see here is that agreement is really treating little pro and big pro in the same way, and the relevant feature information that it cares about is third person. So this supports at least some a proposed unification of, of little pro and big pro, as has been argued for quite a long time. Okay, so now finally I'm going to move on to the interpretation of this type of structure. And the proposal here has two parts. Uh, first, um, subject nominalizations are derived as properties. And secondly, pause is a relation um, between the possessor and this property. So we know that we want these types of nominals to be property denoting. Uh, so for example, they can occur as predicates like you see in 25, I'm a good person or I'm one who is good. Uh, but they can also be used attributively like you see in 26, she's drinking cold coffee. So I'll just note here that Washoe lacks an adjectival category altogether, and this is the only modification strategy that's available in the language. Um, but importantly, right, we know that argument positions are also possible, so this is not surprising. Uh, so we see this here in 27, or I saw the one who was a woman. Um, but here we can assume composition with an old D. Right, so we don't need to say anything too much extra or too surprising about the fact that we can get these in argument position. Now I'm gonna uh, propose here that the property meaning that we want these things to begin as arises via direct predication. Um, direct predication was proposed by Bot 1999 to account for reduced relative structures. Um, so in contrast to a full relative clause, like you see here in 28A, the stocks that are available, 20, 28B shows the reduced form and simply the stocks available. Uh, now properties formed by direct predication have two um, important types of uh, characteristics. First, they don't involve A-bar movement uh, because they're, they're reduced and they don't have an A-bar periphery. And secondly, they contain a semantically vacuous big pro that's present for syntactically, uh, syntactic well-formedness conditions, but doesn't actually have an impact on the semantics. So to give an example from English here in 29A, the stock's available. Um, syntactically, what we'll have is the reduced relative adjoined to the noun that it's modifying. But semantically here, um, we'll just have intersective modification that gives us back the set of stocks that is available. Um, so I think this, this is the right approach to, um, for handling the Washoe cases because the properties of reduced relatives that um, have been established in the literature are also hold of the Washoe case. So for example, one property is that the relativized element is always in the outermost position, which we know is true in Washoe because they're always subject to nominals. 
Additionally, they can appear as a complement of predicative B. And then finally, no complementizer or relative pronoun is permitted. So while you get a type of relative-ish meaning, it's not the case that you have a full type A bar relative clause structure. Um, so this account also explains why these nominalizations can be used attributively, as you see um, for, with 30A, just to go through a derivation um, uh, where um, tall del kaikai is modifying tree. So syntactically, we'll start out with um, just a, an adjoined um, phrase to the noun phrase. And semantically, these two will simply undergo intersective modification, giving us back the set of um, trees that are both that are also tall. Additionally, as I mentioned before, the individual reading rises simply with iota. Um, so to take our woman case again, as in 31a, but we'll have a, we'll start out with a similar syntax here, except this is not a modifier. It's just, it's the entire predicate by itself. And then after composing with a definite article, we'll get back the unique woman. Now, what about pos, right? So there's no canonical um, possessive meaning in these structures. So what is pos doing? Uh, it's not really something that we might expect to see from a semantic perspective. Um, but this issue becomes a bit more pressing actually because Washoe's not alone here. Uh, to, uh, to give another example from Northern Paiute um, here in 32, the one who shot me, Teresa Vandani analyzes this type of subject nominal as also involving a type of pos nominalizer. So he treats the suffix de also as um, a pos head, but it's semantically vacuous in his account. So what we see now is another case of a language that's using a pos morpheme in precisely the same construction, um, which makes you think you might want to have, uh, may, might give the potential for pos doing something semantically. Um, so another place that we see unexpected possession of this kind is in possessive predication. And that's what the parallel I'm going to draw here. And this has been uh, pointed out for Ulwa, a language of Nicaragua by Kunzgarbonin and Frances. Now, what possessive predication is, is it's simply a type of predicate structure in which some kind of possessive semantics is required um, that otherwise you, you might not expect. Um, so to show a, an example of ordinary possession here, we have 33, Alberto stick, where cause a possessive marker. But we see the same suffix used in predication environments like in 44, sorry, <clears throat> sorry 34, she will be tall. Um, so to account for this, they assume a, a slightly special meaning for pos, which is different from a canonical type of assignment, for example, from Barker 1995. Um, and it, what this does is it est establishes a relationship between the possessum, basically, and the possessor, but it's a different kind of possessive relationship. So what is it? Um, in their account, they state the following meaning postulate for pos. For any, any entity in any property, the entity has the property if and only if the entity is in the extension of the property's corresponding predicate. Right, so to make that make a bit more sense here, if we take an example like 37, essentially in their semantics, she will be tall is true, if and only if she is also in the extension of tall, so she'll count as tall. Now we can extend this to the Washoe case as well, if we take the nominalization like in 38, one who heals people, and we can say that this is true of somebody, that they have the property of healing people, um, if they are in the extension of the set of agents of that predicate. So this will work essentially on a part with what we saw in Ulwa. Now this is a, a giant tree that's a bit difficult to um, take in all at once, but essentially this is showing you that pause will take the entire um, verbal structure as its first argument and then establish some relationship with the, a possessor that's not um, actually pronounced higher in the structure. Then this will compose with the silent definite article. And the, at the end of the day, we get the correct meaning, which is the unique individual that stands in a possessive relation to the set of agents of people healing events. So simply the unique individual who is a member of, of a people healing event agent set. And so the benefit of this type of approach is by giving POS a contentful semantics is that we can maintain a tight syntax semantics relationship if POS is actually doing something rather than simply being there as a kind of a functional um, nominalizing layer. Okay, so now I'll just wrap up. Um, so the main points here have been that these types of constructions in Washoe are the result of a generate, sorry, a general predicate formation strategy that's used elsewhere in the language. Um, the syntactic core of this strategy is POSP, which is diagnosed by agreement effects, even though there's no invariant nominalizer present um, in the morphology. And finally, um, POS is semantically contentful and is not just present for um, syntactic reasons. And now we've seen this, in, at least that it's at, at play in a couple of different languages. And just to end with a bigger note, bigger point about this other category that I mentioned, so as opposed to the ER nominals, 
Um, I'd like to just tentatively suggest that this category is most likely always derived this way. And by this way, I mean by a reduced relative plus um, nominalizing material on top. And then one way to understand the source of variation, which generally has to do with the exact verbal projections present, um, is the fact that reduced relatives vary in size across languages. So Baker and Vinokurova has some discussion of this and when they uh, talk about Gikuyu, um, and they know that this type of relative is probably rare. But as Tosar Bandani also points out about Northern Paiu, um, this might not, not actually be the case because we see more and more languages now um, that behave in this way. And that's it, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. We are a little bit out of time, but of course there were some technical issues. So I let you, of course, talk long, a wonderful talk. And uh, we have questions here in the chat room. So maybe we can just start with the first very nice talk. Everybody says it. And thank you so much, Emily. Thank you. Sir. Okay, so Mark. American who lives in England, that's good. <laughs> so Mark Baker asks. Ask you questions, yeah. Mark Baker asks, can you have a similar structure with a first or second person, sorry, first or second person possessor rather than third person? Possibly it can mean something like I the hunter or I who am a hunter. Yeah, so you cannot. Um, these are only generic. They're not, um, they're only interpreted as one who generically hunts or one who generically does something like a person healer. Um, and so the idea is that this is somehow related to the fact that these nominalizations are too small. So pro R can, you know, it can it can pick up third person features either by default or in some other way, but maybe on the idea that first or second features are encoded higher in the clause, some more at the periphery, um, it's not able to, uh, since those layers are not present in the nominalization, it's not able to pick those up. In order to use the first or second person, you need to use a full type of um, nominalization, which is a full CP that's nominalized in Washo. So, uh, yeah, yeah there, I don't know. Are there many more questions? I don't see any in the chat room. I saw only Mark Bakers. By the way, nice to see you. I don't see you, but I know that you are here <laughs> after All such right. a long time. Okay, so. so Sylvia Schreiner has a question. Else? If you can still, of course, ask questions uh, after this talk and you can discuss it. It's worse. I have a lot of questions, but I'm the chair, so I cannot ask them now. I will ask you later of the, on the relatives, which I just worked on with Peter Karlik from Brno about uh, nominalization of relative clauses in Czech. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I think that we should, however, we have still really. It's not true. Yeah, we have still some three, four There's minutes. There's a question in the chat, if I can answer that. Yeah. So if, oh, I see that there is one, a lot of compliments, but one is here, Sylvia Schreiner. Yeah, so she uh, writes, a uh, bit Scottish of data that I yeah. gave interest from Scottish Daily. Gaelic, possessive involved in yeah. a particular Maybe kind of medication. You have time, you have time. You can Essentially, it. she is in her doctor. Oh, that's, yeah, that's cool. That's definitely relevant. And I would love it if you would send me that paper. Thank you. I think uh, something in old Irish, we have a very similar construction, which is Gaelic, of course, Gaelic, Gaelic. I did it. So maybe, yeah, there will, uh, I, I think this talk was so motivating. We, uh, we will have discussions on it uh, and we will continue. And, and there is one more, maybe, no everything's cool so thank you all uh, discussant and for uh, and uh, above all uh, of the also the presenter presenter uh, emily from uh, i don't know you come from from usa maybe but you are in manchester now seated and um, our uh, next talk uh, will so thank you once once again thank, thank you once you. again for your talk wonderful talk very interesting I'm now coming to the next two, but there is only one presenting. It's Irina Burukina uh, from Ötvesh Laurent University, Hungary. Uh, so, so far from Berlin. <laughs> and uh, another uh, speaker who is not here. She's pres is she present? No, Alexandra Kubiatieva, Russian State University of the Humanities. And you will present a talk on the subject, on, on the topic, on the nature of arguments in event nominals. Thank you very uh, yes. much for coming. Thank you so much for the introduction. So I have just dropped the link to the uh, chat where you can download the handout. And uh, I hope you can see the screen. I hope this is... Yeah.
fine. Okay, so yeah, so I will present this talk for both of us today. And uh, in this talk, we would like to discuss event deverbal event nominals in Kakchikel, which is a Mayan ergative language. And first thing to know about those nominals is that they're so-called mixed categories. So they involve uh, the verbal course, some verbal projections, and then there are some nominal projections on top of that. And this approach is, of course, well known from the literature. We have seen it already today. And uh, the two questions which we will um, try to answer today with regard to those nominals are the following. So the first question is, what argument positions are available within the verbal part? And this come to Kachikel because there these ik nominals can only be derived out of intransitive verbs. And there is only, there has already been this uh, quite recent proposal by Imanisha, for instance, that actually external arguments cannot be present at all in those um, uh, event nominalizations. And this proposal is uh, quite close to the one, for instance, made by Alexiado for some European languages. So this is quite an important question, whether we can have an ergative, for instance, predicates being nominalized or not, and whether we can have those external arguments projected in the verbal part of such nominalizations. And we will try to show some novel data from Kakchike that suggests that the restriction on nominalizations, for instance, is uh, too restrictive, it doesn't match the data, and that actually external arguments can be present. And the second question that we will address is the following. So what is the status of the arguments in that verbal parts of a mixed nominal? And there are currently two approaches on the market. The first one says that, well, we have lexical DPs and we merge them directly into the argument positions. And the second approach essentially says that, no, you fill in those positions with big pros, and then you bind those pros by some higher arguments in uh, the nominal part, for instance. So let's say by a possessor. And uh, when it comes to Mayan languages in particular, uh, both approaches um, have been adopted by different people, but there has been no sufficient support for either one of them. And to the best of my knowledge, for instance, there is this just uh, one work by Mark Baker, where he uh, provides some support, some sufficient support for pro analysis for English gerunds, for instance. And usually people just pick up one of these approaches and go with it. So we will try to show again that event nominals in Kakchike involve control. So you merge big pros in the argument positions. And in particular, we will try to draw this nice parallel between control inside nominals and control uh, in, clause of, in the case of clausal complementation. So usually when people talk about control and nominalizations, they talk about either uh, nominals controlling into their complements, for instance, or control into nominals, right, from um, the main clause. So we will try to show that we have control established between the two parts of the same uh, mixed nominal, between the verbal part and uh, the possessor in the nominal part. And you can see it's schematized here in one. So we have this verbal core up to voice P, and then we have possessor merged externally in one of the nominal projections. And this possessor controls uh, via predicative control, uh, big pro in the argument position. And unfortunately, I believe I won't have enough time to go through this uh, very nice piece of additional support that we have related to the behavior of anti-passive, but it's in the handout, so you are very welcome to ask me questions about it later. Um, okay, so first I will briefly discuss the main properties of these economicals to show that they are indeed these mixed categories. And first thing to know about them is that again, they can only, um, this kind of nominalization can only be applied to inherently intransitive or detransitivized predicates. So let's say we have this transitive verb tiho, and here in glosses and following this traditional Mayanist uh, convention, so to say. So ergative is uh, amorphous with possessive in Kakchukil. And so ergative and possessive are, mar are glossed as set A marker. Marcus, so A stands for ergative and possessive. And absolutive is glossed as set B. So B stands for absolutive in glosses. Okay, so we have this transitive predicate, to teach. It has uh, internal argument, the boy in the first example, and it has external argument, we. We is the subject, boy is the object, all is fine. Then we can passivize, we can detransitivize this predicate. So we attach this suffix sh, 
and the external argument disappears, the internal argument, the boy is now promoted to the subject function. And then we can take this passive form and we can nominalize it. So we attach suffix ik on top of that basically. And we get this nominal ruti hoshik. Uh, we still have no external argument. It has disappeared because it's passive, but we still have this ex sorry, internal argument here, and it is cross-referenced by the possessive prefix on the nominal. So Ruti Hoshik is basically his teaching, the boy's teaching. And we can take this nominal, we can embed it under different predicates. For instance, we can embed it under the verb to begin, and the sentence can literally be translated as we began uh, or we initiated the boy's teaching. So, uh, as I mentioned, these nominals, they exhibit this mixed behavior. And let me scroll down to it, yes. Okay, so they have some nominal properties, namely they can be combined with determiners and finite verbs, for example, cannot do that. And they also prohibit uh, tense or aspect marking, which is again obligatory for finite verbs. And on the other hand, they exhibit some verbal behavior. So let's say they can contain this voice morphology as we have just seen with passive suffix. And they are also compatible with exclusively verbal adjuncts. So if you take a look at the examples here in five, we have this adverb aninek, which can be combined with the uh, ik nominal. So this is fine. 5a is grammatical. It can also be combined with the finite verb. So 5c is also grammatical, but it cannot be combined, let's say, with a, a referential noun or with a result noun. So I cannot say aninek or samach aninek. So I cannot say like quick word or quick work using this um, lexical item. So to summarize this uh, very quickly, we follow this general sort of convention that ik nominals are indeed mixed nominals, that they contain this verbal extended projection up to voice P. And then they also have at least two additional nominal projections on top of that. So we believe that they have first this little NP, which is basically the nominalizer, and we also follow uh, some literature on Mayan languages, and we uh, assume that the possessor is based generated in the specifier of this little NP. And then we have DP on top of that. So basically D is responsible for accommodating this determiner. And it's also responsible for assigning this ergative slash possessive case, which is essentially the same one in Africa. And um, we have some data to show that indeed, for example, there is no uh, TP or no, let's say, IP in these nominals. I don't have time to go through it, but it's in the appendix. Uh, please take a look at it later. Okay, so now let's go back to our two questions. So the first question was uh, about the presence of this external argument, right? If we have here voice P and below that we have little VP, which usually hosts this external argument, can it be present in uh, these ik nominals? And we address this question because, as I mentioned, it's been recently proposed by Imanishi that actually all kakchikil nominals must obligatorily lack this syntactically projected external argument. And in and this proposal, like his proposal, falls uh, very nicely in line with the more recent uh, claim by Alexiado that in many Indo-European languages, for example, only an accusative verbs can be nominalized. So that's why we decided to also address this question. And Imanishi uh, mainly looks at pairs of examples like the one and seven. So here we have two intransitive verbs being nominalized. And the first one to fall is allegedly an accusative predicate. And when we nominalize it, we can still see this argument being present. And this argument is cross-referenced by the possessive marker on the nominal. And when we nominalize what looked like what looks like uh, an negative predicate based in this case, uh, then we suddenly don't have this possessive marker. And so Imanisha looks at such pairs of examples and he says, well, uh, in the second case, we have something like semantic control being established between the main subject and this understood argument of the nominal, but that understood argument cannot be realized syntactically. That's why we don't see this possessive marker. So what we want to do is we want to show some novel data. We want to basically um, add some more examples to the picture because Imanisha mostly considers matrix verbs like uh, chap, which is begin, and also uh, and also ahin, which is uh, the progressive marker, the progressive verb. Uh, 
And those verbs, they enforce coreference between the metric subject and the embedded argument. So it's quite logical that there we may actually uh, drop this possessive mark and establish semantic control, right? But we want to show some examples that involve the matrix verb aho, which means want. And in that case, this coreference is not enforced at all, right? So it's quite logical to have a situation where you have one person who wants something and a different person who must actually perform that wanted event, if you want, um, or like action. And so if we go to such examples, then we suddenly see this possessive marker appearing again and again, which with what looks like um, nominalized an ergative verb. So you can take a look at 8a, for instance, we have this, I want the children to bathe quickly. And literally it could be translated as, I want the children's quick bathing or something like this. And so the children here, if we believe that atin uh, similarly to its translation equivalents in other languages is an ergative verb, then this uh, children is uh, an external argument cross-referenced by this possessive marker. So external arguments survive. Of course, we must show at this point that these verbs, for example, that you can see in eight being nominalized are indeed an ergative predicate and not suddenly an accusative predicate. Um, there is not that much support for that in the Mayanese literature, uh, but we found two diagnostics that can be applied here and that show that this is indeed the case, that these verbs are an ergative. So the first one is this optional agreement test originally proposed for Santiago Tsutuhil, another Mayan language. And the empirical observation behind this test is that uh, plural third person objects uh, only optionally uh, cross-referenced by the absolutive marker while agreement with subjects of transitive verbs is obligatory. And so when we now take a look at intransitive verbs, they fall very neatly into two different categories. So one of them, uh, like some of them, such as for instance, the verb tsak fall, don't have to encode their sole argument via this absolutive clitic. And so in that case, this sole argument behaves as an, an internal argument. And then uh, some other verbs such as tsopin, piyin, and atin, those verbs that you've just seen in those uh, examples earlier, uh, they are so argument patterns with the uh, transitive subjects. And uh, it does not allow this optionality in uh, agreement, which is really nice. And the second test that we want to use to sort of uh, add some additional support here is the subextraction diagnostic. So uh, this pattern was noticed by Kuhn, for example, for Chol, which is yet another Mayan language. And the idea is that a bar movement of a possessor out of internal arguments is possible without pipe piping, but subextraction out of external arguments is prohibited. So you can see examples in 12. In Kakchike, this pattern is attested when it comes to uh, prepositional possessors or possessors that are introduced by this relational noun chain. So in 12, for example, we have this base example, uh, they saw Pedro's dog, literally something like they saw the dog of Pedro. And so here, if you want to ask the question about this embedded possessor, right, you can subextract it alone and you can leave the rest of the nominal phrase behind basically. So 12C is grammatical, at least for some native speakers. So I can ask of whom they see the dog. Uh, but this is not possible with transitive subjects, right? So if we have examples like um, they like see the rabbits of Pedro, I cannot ask a question of whom see the rabbits. This is ungrammatical in Kakchike. And so again, when it comes to intransitive verbs, they uh, can be divided into two different groups. So Zak, for example, allows this subextraction. And so pin, pin, and the teen do not allow this subextraction. So you can see this illustrated in 14 and 15 respectively. So I can ask of whom uh, falls the book, this is fine, but I cannot ask of whom jumps up or jump the rabbits, okay? So uh, these data show that indeed, apparently Tsak is an accusative. So it uh, is not that relevant for us here, but so pin, pin, and the teen are a negative predicates. And so the fact that we can nominalize them and the fact that we can still have that possessive marker and them cross-referencing the uh, argument 
uh, suggested that the restriction on nominalization does not actually match the Kakchika data and that it must be revised. So that was the first question. So we can have both internal arguments and external arguments in Kakchika nominals. And now the second question is, so what are those arguments, right? Do we merge uh, referential DPs immediately in their argument positions, or do we put big pro there first, and then we control that big pro by something else higher up in the structure? So our proposal here is that uh, the verbal part of a nick nominal contains a pro variable. So remember, only intransitive or detransitivized predicates can be nominalized. So we are talking about just one variable, no other arguments there. And this variable is merged in the argument position first, and it gets controlled by higher possessor merged in the specifier of little np. And importantly, this kind of control is predicative control following Landau's proposal for clausal complementation. So let me show you the structure instance for nominalization of passivized and an accusative predicates first. So what we have here is we have this mixed nominal. We have the verbal part up to voice P, and then we have the nominal part, little NP with the possessor, and then DP, uh, so cases assigned essentially by the D hat. So what we have here is the following. We merge this big pro in the original argument position in the verbal part, in the complement of BB, and then we move it. And we need to do that to turn this voice P into the predicate, to introduce the so-called lambda abstract. And here you can see this uh, tiny little uh, structure for the derivation of predicative subject control in clauses taken from Landau's monograph, right? So here we have basically the very same situation. We have uh, non-finite fin P, where we have big pro in the subject position, and then we move it to the spec fin P to turn this fin P into a predicate. And so what we do next is we take this predicate, this voice P, and we predicate it out of this possessor. And so essentially little n here is the relator. Again, uh, we have this very nice parallel with the predicative control um, in clauses where according to Landau, little v serves as such as relator establishing again predication between uh, the matrix argument and the embedded non-finite fin P. So we have this very neat parallels. And uh, if we have a negative predicate, then again, we have a very similar situation. So we have these two projections, little VP and voice P. And for Kakchikar, we know that we need both of them independently. So that has been, this is not our proposal that has been already proposed by Jessica Kuhn and by many other researchers that we need these two projections, uh, one on top of the, the other one. And so importantly, the external argument is merged in the lower one of, this, of those two projections. And then there is some space left uh, for this big pro to move to, to create this predicate out of this voice P. And then again, we establish predication relation between the voice P and the possessor. And uh, we have, of course, some empirical support for this analysis that indeed we are dealing with control and not with something like ECM or raising, I don't know. So typically to distinguish between control and raising, people look at uh, the following three tests. We have idiom chunk test, we have voice transformation test, and we have expletive phenomenalization test. Unfortunately, there, is no, there are no expletive pronouns in Kakchikel. It's a pro drop language. And voice transformation test is also not applicable here because remember, these nominals can also can only be derived from uh, passivized, for example, predicates, and can't be derived from transitive predicates. But we can apply the idiom chunks test, and there is this uh, expression, uh, which means to feel compassion or sad for someone. So this verb uh, has already been, um, how do you say it? It can only be used in this idiomatic expression, but it can be used there as a normal transitive predicate, so it can be passivized, for instance. And that's what's uh, the most important for us here. So we can have it uh, transitive, we can have it passivized nice and well, but we cannot nominalize it. As soon as we nominalize it, we lose the idiomatic expression, uh, the idiomatic reading, and because this is the only reading that we can have here, the whole sentence is now ungrammatical. So uh, we suppose that this suggests that indeed, uh, this uh, phrase that we have here under nominalization is not base generated as uh, an argument of the uh, verbal part of this nominal. 
and it is merged actually higher in the structure as a possessor. And the second piece of support here comes from the behavior of prepositional possessors. So in Kakchikel, we have two kinds of possessors. And so far, we have seen only um, those possessors in um, nominals which are cross-referenced by this possessive marker, right? Uh, there is also the second kind of possessor, prepositional possessor or possessor introduced by this relational noun chin. And importantly, we can have both of them with nominalizations. So let's take a look very quickly at these examples in 21. So in 21a, we have this uh, nominal Ruti uh, Hoshik Rishta Maria. So we have here possessor Rishta Maria, and it is cross referenced by this possessive marker. And we may ask ourselves, well, maybe this Rishta Maria is actually an argument in the verbal part, right? That's still possible. But take a look at the second example. So here we have the very same meaning. And now we have this possessor being introduced externally uh, in this prepositional phrase. So we have Riti Hoshi Krchin Rishta Maria. So it's basically teaching of Maria, if you want. Uh, the interesting thing here is that uh, no argument of passive uh, form can be introduced by this relational noun or chin. So it cannot be analyzed as an argument of this uh, passive form, for instance. It can only be analyzed as this possessor in the nominal part of this nominalization. And we believe that, for example, if we try to advocate, let's say, movement analysis, right? It would be very hard to explain how we uh, base generate something as a DP and then we move it into a relator, into a relational noun phrase, for instance, basically into a prepositional phrase. So we believe that these data um, can only be analyzed uh, by adopting this uh, control analysis. And uh, to summarize this, I think it is very nice that we can show these uh, parallels between, again, like control in clauses and control in nominals. And I think that is very nice uh, as well that Kakchikil provides this additional support for finally distinguishing between the two analysis, uh, between the DP analysis and the pro analysis. And as I mentioned uh, at the very beginning, we also have some additional support coming from this very unusual behavior of antipassive under nominalization. I'm sorry, I don't have time to talk about it right now, but it's in the handout. Please take a look and ask me questions if you're interested. Thank you so much. Excellent, time keeping, everything wonderful. A very interesting talk. Thank you very much. And we start the discussion. Okay. We have 10 minutes exactly, or nine and a half. Thank you until in my place, it's 7.30 PM. So please ask questions, very interesting talk. Tom Roper, I see his raising hand. Don't see it where it is. <laughs> I don't see his questions. Oh, maybe he can ask a question directly. Or Tom, I don't know why. So, I'm not sure if it's technically possible. I believe that the attendees yeah, must else, type okay. their questions. They have just, well, yeah, but I don't see, I do, and does anybody see the, in the chat room, the, the answer, the questions of Tom, or was he not asking? <laughs> you know, a ah, moment here. We have no, I don't see anything. Does anybody want to ask a question to Irina? Which is a very nice talk. Is it, I may, I don't know. If nobody else, I will. Thank you. Take the, the right. Don't want to be like Trump, but I just want to ask really. I'm interested in the distinction that you had in the examples about anergatives and anaccusatives. So could you uh, somehow, is there any kind of explanation on structural grounds why these two different behaviors are in the same, is it predictable, so to say, from the structure we, which we usually know that anergatives have had actually an merged real subject and not deep structural object uh, and accusatives have the, the analysis that the uh, uh, deep structural argument, the sole argument is actually a deep structural object and coming to the light VP specified position. So how would you explain it once again within the structure of this? It's an incorporating language, isn't it? Which you are concerned with. Mm. Is it polysynthesis? There or, is no real. Or is it more agglutinative or? 
What kind so of... Kakchukun is not a polysynthetic language yet, and there is no true incorporation in this language. Okay. There is some uh, cases so of like pseudo incorporation. More like like uh, incorporating, but uh, more agglutinative or whatever as a type. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So these restrictions uh, that I was talking about was actually about um, the ban of external arguments to be part of the, um, um, in one case you had uh, a ban on extraction, which is maybe not only, it, I mean, it's an extraposition of the left branch extraction examples, which we know are always the mm -hmm. same, the same type of which we use also for differentiating between DP languages and NP, like uh, Jelko Boschko, which does for Serbian versus uh, other languages which have uh, mm -hmm. different articles. So, is there any um, kind of evidence that there are barriers or some kind of islands that uh, protect uh, the mm -hmm. guys to move or to, to be extracted? Can you explain uh, it? In your yeah, so. If I understood your question correctly, you are asking not like about nominals themselves, but about the general distinction between yeah. like a negative yeah. and an accusative, right? Yes, so, yes. Uh, yeah. Pattern, yeah. yeah, so so far we've been using that data, uh, like we've been mostly referring to those like empirical observations and we were not trying to provide a formal analysis for them. And luckily for us, for instance, the first test that we use, the, uh, op the optional agreement test, for example, uh, there is this wonderful formal proposal how to explain that optionality in Santiago Tsutuhil, for instance, put forward by um, uh, Levin, uh, Rodrigo Ranero, and Paulina Liskova. So we can just refer to their work, so to say. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to sub-extraction, this is definitely something to think about, and we really want to work more on that, especially because we are referring to Jessica Kuhn's work, but she's working on Chol. And in Chol, it's a little bit different. In Chol, we have sub-extraction of uh, simple possessors. And in Kakchikil, for example, sub-extraction of all simple possessors is just prohibited. So all of them must um, involve this pipe piping. And it's only possible to sub-extract those prepositional possessors and only out of internal arguments. So the picture is much more complicated there. And to be completely honest with you, there is also some kind of variation between the speakers. So some speakers just prohibit all sub-extraction altogether in all cases. So I don't have an answer right now. This is something to think about, but this is a very interesting topic and the picture is just crazy. I'm so happy to have been chair of this wonderful session. If there are no other questions, we, we have uh, to... I think we have some questions in the uh, question answer chat. Okay, so please, please uh, go on and try to answer it. And uh, yes, yeah, Draman, I see Emily, sorry. Tom Rapper is also here and Mark Baker again. Yeah, so please, uh, you just make the choice on the chats that you take. Uh, okay, I so. <laughs> I know them all. <laughs> so maybe Emily, women first. <laughs> okay, so uh, I believe that like my answer to most of this question would be something like, thank you so much for these comments. I don't know how to answer them yet, but we will think about this. <laughs> okay. um, this is especially true for the very last question, for instance, from Emily, that um, yeah. something must indeed account for this like broader typological restriction, right? But again, we don't see it in Kakchikil and that's something yeah. to think about. Yeah, um, I think that in this case, I can also uh, say only thank you to all participants of this session, very highly motivating. I actually decided to go on with linguistics after the session, uh, even though I'm already 65 years old, but I will still go on because uh, there is no time limit on linguistics. And thank you very much all over the world. Uh, we are happy that USA is progressing towards a good, uh, solution that we in linguistics we don't have these problems we have only extraction problems or other problems thank you so much for these wonderful three talks we are now closing this session and we will see each other or whoever comes to the next session
I will be chairing as well in the same room, which will be semantics one degrees, Roman one. Thank you so much again, all of the speakers. It was a really a high level of syntax, which I have, been, and also semantics, formal semantics was implemented in, of course, in Emily's talk, for example. Thank you, Xenia. Uh, thank you, Emily. Thank you, Irina, and the other speaker who is not here, and maybe as a somewhere in the background. Thank you so much for all uh, people coming from all over the world. Especially, I would like to thank also those people who uh, have asked very interesting questions. And as we see, uh, everything can be discussed maybe in the chat rooms or um, there are some possibilities to go on to the discussion. Thank you for listening to me to my Czech accent in English. But I'm happy that I saw you all guys and healthy in this pandemic situation. Stay safe. Thank you very much and bye bye. And I think that Ken can close it for us. Thank you. Thank you for attending. Um, this session will now close but we'll reopen if you would like to check out the next session. Thank you very much again. Bye-bye.